welcome to our latest episode of Wellbeing Wednesdays, the National Council's virtual series on healthcare. In this episode, Tremaine Alamine, Vice President of Mental Health First Aid at the National Council for Mental Wellbeing, will sit down with child and adolescent mental health experts, Dr. Sarah Coffey and Dr. Adelaide Robb to discuss mental health challenges young people are facing, the acute impact on young women and people of color, and the role schools play in providing students the resources to overcome mental health challenges. Now, please welcome our host, Tremaine el -Amin. Thank you so much for joining us today for Wellbeing Wednesdays, the National Council's virtual town hall on mental well-being and issues that affect the delivery of care for those who provide care as well. Summer vacations have come to end and the young people are back in school. Since the beginning of the pandemic, young people have carried more than backpacks to school. They may also be carrying the burden of depression and anxiety with them. And those pressures haven't gone away, even as we emerge from the pandemic. Last year, the U.S. Surgeon General reported that 44% of U.S. high school students feel persistently sad or hopeless. In 2021, emergency room visits for suicide attempts increased by 51% for adolescent girls and 4% for boys compared to two years earlier. The shortage of professionals has made it even more difficult for young people to seek help. And the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry reported in May 2023 that there's a drastic shortage of child and adolescent psychiatrists across the U.S. So don't even get me started on social media, which when used inappropriately, we know can enable cyberbullying and feed on insecurities. Suffice it to say that times are really tough for young people, but today we're going to talk about the youth mental health crisis with people who are at the forefront of this healthcare emergency. I am so honored to be joined today uh, by two individuals who are experts in this space, Dr. Sarah Coffey and Dr. Adelaide Robb, and we're going to discuss what mental health challenges young people are facing how this impacts young people and women of color, as well as the role that we are playing uh, as we provide those resources that are so critically necessary. I just wanna give an opportunity for both of you to just introduce yourself uh, to our uh, those that are joining us on this webinar. And um, I will start with uh, Dr. Rob. Hi, first of all, Tremaine, I wanna thank you and the rest of the Mental Health Wellness Wednesday team for inviting us. I think that start, and I'm at Children's National in Washington, DC. So we see people across the Maryland, Virginia and DC region. And we've seen a dramatic increase in, in children coming for help. I'm Dr. Sarah Coffey, also a child and adolescent psychiatrist in Oklahoma. Um, I serve at an academic institution as the interim chair, as well as a child psychiatry consultant for our Oklahoma Child Welfare. Uh, and so certainly see kids all across the state of Oklahoma and couldn't agree more. Um, we're at a bit of a pinnacle point of crisis for kids' mental health um, and really appreciate the opportunity to talk about it here. And so grateful that you have very different geographies. So you're seeing the country in terms of where uh, things are showing up for young people and how um, they are facing the challenges as well as the providers, you know, that are there. I know back in February, there was this study from uh, the CDC, uh, which found uh, what they called unprecedented level of hopelessness, right? And suicidal thoughts among the nation's youth. The numbers are staggering, you know, I, I think that we're seeing this show up. I know that parents and caregivers are seeing this show up as well, you know, it, it, whether it's high school students, I think they found 42% uh, of high school students saying they were experiencing these like persistent feelings of sadness. Um, and, and that's been increasing steadily as well as, you know, uh, the difference between maybe female students and those that might be part of LGBTQ plus uh, communities who are over 50%. In, in the same or similar experiences. Um, and so that 
change, that shift uh, among those high school students who are considering suicide, um, those that are making plans, those one in five who might have had a, a, an attempt or considered uh, suicide seriously in the last year. Um, I think it's really important to have these discussions. So I want to ask each of you to share what you're seeing and hearing from that you know, perspective. You talked about where you are geographically, um, but would love to hear a little bit more about who your youth clients are and what they're experiencing, as well as, you know, the general severity of, of these experiences that you're seeing. Um, and maybe we can start with uh, Dr. Rob. We're seeing a drastic increase in, in suicide attempts and even just feeling stressed. So the kids come in, they're overwhelmed, they've lost two years of their lives of friendship because everybody was stuck at home on Zoom and you couldn't have that friend-to-friend -friend connection and growth opportunity that would normally happen from going to school. And so coping skills haven't kept up with age. And as we approach adolescence and we have all of the hormonal changes and we know rates of depression go up, especially for young ladies during their adolescence, that we then have somebody who has less mature coping skills, is overwhelmed by stress, is feeling isolated, and then the depression kicks in and they don't know where to go for help. They don't know who to ask. And so our approach at Children's has been to reach them wherever they are. So we have psychologists, psychiatric nurse practitioners, and psychiatrists embedded in our primary care clinics scattered across the district, including in our underserved areas. So if you go to the pediatrician, they do a, a PHQ-9 depression screening questionnaire, you score high, there's a mental health care practitioner right there. We've worked with TD Bank to get a child psychiatrist consulting into the psychologist and the social workers at some of our DC charter schools. So if you're at school and you tell the nurse, I'm feeling suicidal, we can have our child psychiatrist or one of our fellows reach out and provide advice to that person who's talking to you and make that decision. Therapy, come to the emergency room for something more, or where do we send you for the next thing? And at a broader level, we're involved in the Commonwealth of Virginia with Virginia VMAP, Virginia Mental Health Access for Primary Care, where pediatricians and clinicians in the community can sign up for the service and when they have a child in their office, and again, they're concerned, ADHD, autism, whatever it is, they can call into a number, get screened, and either get resources through a care manager, or if they have a specific question about medication, they can call in, and Children's Covers Northern Virginia, the, the Commonwealth has five regions, it's that big, and on Friday afternoon, they'll be talking to me. And I've had pediatricians ask about everything. I tried this stimulant, it didn't work. I'm really worried about this kid, but her parent won't let her get mental health care. How can I help her as a pediatrician? And that's paired with ongoing educational classes for the pediatricians. I think we have to have a very broad approach because a one size fit all is not going to get our youth the help they need so they can make it through adolescence and go on to the rest of their lives. Because that's our real mission, is keeping them well enough that they can grow up and become adults, successful adults, whatever that means. You know, what I love most about what you said, Dr. Rob, is meeting the needs of the provider community, as well as the needs of those young people and where they are kind of in place, you know, um, that multi-pronged approach across so many levels of care, having that opportunity to, to really engage with young people, but also those providers to give them the skills that they need or access to information that they might need to make real-time decisions, um, which is so critically important, especially as things are moving. And I know uh, uh, for Dr. Coffey, your your uh, um, location is different, uh, but I'm sure that there's some similarities there. And so for you, what what would you uh, kind of outline um, about the work that in what you're seeing locally? Yeah, for sure. Um, and couldn't agree more. I think, you know, during the time of the COVID pandemic, we were really responding to that additional need for physical health care needs. Um, but many of us were concerned of the wave of mental health care needs that were going to occur following the pandemic. And we're certainly seeing that. 
Um, you know, we're seeing rises in anxiety and depression, not only for children, but also their parents. Um, and I certainly um, think it's important to remember taking care of the caregivers that are taking care of children, um, because all of us were impacted by COVID and we're still seeing the lingering effects, as Dr. Rob mentioned, um, emotionally and developmentally. Um, again, I couldn't agree more with the uh, importance of having a multi-pronged approach um, to really tackle this um, this you know, ongoing endemic issue that we're seeing in child mental health care. Um, and at Oklahoma State University, um, we too just launched a Oklahoma um, Child Psychiatry Access Line. Uh, Dr. Rob, I'm also a Friday afternoon consultant. Um, that's my time as well. So I was excited to hear you're doing that too. Um, I, I love being a part of that line and being able to help our pediatricians, um, family medicine docs, nurse practitioners that are on the front line seeing families, um, many of whom um, perhaps were um, not willing to come forward or struggling to come forward to recognize that their child was having a mental health need and being able to keep kids um, in the office, make connections and referrals to community mental health centers and others. Um, we need to be thinking about this strategically. Um, I might put a plug to that HRSA um, really provided a lot of grants um, to start um, child psychiatry access lines across the nation, but we need to find ways to sustain them uh, because the reality is, is that we're, um, we're needing more child and adolescent psychiatrists, but we're never going to be able to meet the need. Um, but goodness, if we can be in the community and support our pediatricians and others, if we can consult and find ways to get children and families the help that they need, um, I think all of us would want to advocate for that. The other thing that we do too at, um, at OSU is we have an echo line, um, which I know the National Council has an echo line as well. Um, so we have two echo lines that focus um, on, on children and adolescents and infants. We have an infant mental health echo line because uh, certainly we know that early intervention is very, um, is very important in the work that we do. Uh, and these are great opportunities across the nation. If you haven't had a chance to call into our National Council echo or other echoes, highly encourage you to do this. Um, so I was one of the the kind of starts of our pediatric echo line. And I was patting myself on the back about how great this was going to be for the community. Um, and goodness, when I sat on that line um, and as a hub team member and had family medicine docs and nurses and school counselors and others calling in, um, I learned so much. Um, and I think um, the work that we do caring for pediatric mental health is quite hard um, and it's really challenging. And we're often holding the hope for a lot of families that have been really struggling. Um, and, it's, and it really should be a team effort. I think when we're working together and working collaboratively, and um, we can do so much to support families um, and just really appreciate the opportunity to be here with this team and to recognize um, some great things that are going on um, to help support families moving forward. Absolutely. I think so many things that you said uh, made me think of how it really does take all of us, right, to, to make this happen at every level of the systems that exist. Um, and what works for when one place may not work in another, um, but there are some threads and some opportunities to be consistent across um, the board. I think also what's very interesting to me um, about both of your responses to, to this question and your responses, frankly, in your communities is this, this, this thread of making sure that what is uh, being provided is resonant and relevant for the audience that you're in front of. Um, and I know that there's a ton of disparity as it relates to um, uh, communities of color, individuals who are um, uh, their their financial situation might be uh, mean that access to care is difficult or there's some uh, challenges there. Um, but also in terms of young people themselves, you know, if we think about uh, the the disparity that existed in the data that I talked about a little bit earlier, if we think about the research uh, and what it's demonstrating about specifically Black youth, uh, specifically um, the higher incidence of and rise of suicide attempts around uh, young people over the last uh, few years. And if we think about also um, just the, the severity of those symptoms that's coming up, uh, given the environmental impacts that might exist. Um, I, I'd be interested to hear uh, for communities that you're in uh, as it relates to um, young people and young Black people specifically or, and uh, other youth of color, what does that look like and how is that showing up in your spaces right now? More than 50% of the children that we serve are African American and maybe about 10 to 15% are Latin. And it helps a lot 
when you have a treatment team that is made up of people who look like the families that they're taking care of. People feel more comfortable. People feel a little bit more able to be open and honest. And I think they realize that everyone cares about them and it's easier to have conversations. I know when we've had Spanish speaking individuals who are on the team, having that conversation without the extra barrier of a translator makes a huge difference. And so one of our, our clinics in DC, the Columbia Heights location, part of the job requirement is your job interview is in Spanish. So our psychologists who are embedded there and our child psychiatrist who works with them all speak Spanish fluently. And even then there's the Central American dialect and the South American different countries. And if you're from Brazil, you speak Portuguese. But, but being able to communicate without having to go through a third party makes a huge difference as well. And, and we had a child who was from a Portuguese speaking nation in Africa, Mozambique on our inpatient unit. And so then we had our Brazilian translator and trying to figure out what food was okay. I mean, even simple things like you're not eating in the hospital, is it because of your depression or because the food's not familiar? And so we thought about what kind of food would be appropriate. And we helped that child get the right food off the menu in the hospital so she wasn't starving on top of already being sad and in the hospital. But but meeting people where they are and having an understanding of the burden, like that's why we have mental health care in our pediatric clinics, because who wants to get take a bus to a subway, to another shuttle bus to get to our main outpatient satellite in a different part of the city? If you can just go to your pediatrician's office, which is three blocks from your house, it's a lot easier to get mental health care. I will also say that having the ability to do telemedicine really lowered the burden because all of the mayor in DC made sure everybody had a tablet or a computer during the pandemic. And if you have a tablet and computer, you can get Zoom telemedicine to your home. And that took that barrier away when nobody wanted to drive, nobody wanted to be around other patients, and you can see a person's face. And part of our work is the facial expression. Do they look sad? Are they moving their facial muscles? Is there a medication side effect? All of that. You could see what their house was like. You could see they had food. We had sometimes where the parents were ill, and I'd talk to an older sibling and say, you know, if your parent has trouble breathing, do you know how to call 911? Because they might have to go to the hospital and even safety and food. And how is food getting delivered to the house if mom can't go to the grocery store because she has COVID? And understanding that they could get Uber Eats or Instacart or something so you knew food was coming. And because those kinds of things we never think about, and yet they're so important or having for our families, our, our nursing staff in the summertime does food drives because many of our children that we serve get breakfast and lunch at school. And when school is closed in July and August, you don't get breakfast and lunch. And so we wanted to make sure that we had food available for families and partnering with some of the community and community serving mental health care satellites throughout the city is important as well. I think we have so much more that we can do. We've got a, a grant from the Marriott Foundation to expand our embedded and primary care work, because I think it's so much easier for people to accept mental health support and evaluation and treatment in a place that's already their medical home where they feel comfortable. It mm -hmm. lowers that barrier and it lowers the stigma. You're just going to the pediatrician's office. Nobody has to know if you don't wanna talk about it that you're getting treatment for depression or treatment for anxiety. And I think that makes a difference. Absolutely. Meeting those needs uh, when it comes to stigma, but also meeting the hierarchy of needs, right? The physical health, the the making sure that the resources are available and having that observation and being able to get a lens into someone's life, especially for young people and their caregivers that you otherwise might not have ever had based on the setting, right? I, I think that is just such a, a powerful piece. And then also that culturally relevant uh, care, right? Meeting folks 
with the resources that would resonate with them. Um, I think that is such a, a, an opportunity um, for others to continue to, we are all learning and growing and, and going further um, to, to meet those needs. And so really great opportunities and nuggets for folks to take with them. Uh, Dr. Coffey, same question. Yeah, um, and such an important question and completely agree about the importance of representation. Um, you know, I think certainly medicine, mental health, um, our school serving systems too still have a lot of work to do to make sure that we're reducing barriers for marginalized populations to, to come and be a part of that representation. I know that's certainly a huge push in thinking about um, the barriers that already exist for many people not being able to move forward. The other thing that was coming to my mind too, um, and kind of my own practice and thinking about um, the school, uh, the school to prison pipeline and recognizing so many young black children um, that are dismissed from school because of quote behavior problems or something else that's going on. Um, I'm, I'm recalling just so many times that um, that I've cared for children where they've been bounced around from school to school to school um, without any um, real, I think, true kind of psychiatric evaluation, conversation about what might be going on in the home, learning disorders, neurodevelopmental disorders, or other things that are going on. Um, and goodness, I think all of us need to have an awareness um, of the challenges that continue to persist um, in our society that can really contribute to um, some, some really unfortunate things that are happening to our communities. The other thing I was thinking about too, you were mentioning um, the role of students um, and kind of how we have them seek access um, and you know, couldn't agree more. I think that um, really making sure that our school systems and places where kids are, um, are really understanding the importance of emotional health, um, understanding that it's okay to not be okay and knowing where to go to seek help. Um, I know our mental health first aid does a lot of work around this as well, but, um, you know, students and youth are often um, speaking to each other about how things are going. And there's a lot of great programs across the nation that kind of have student-led groups um, with some kind of faculty supervision that if they notice that a student is struggling um, or perhaps uh, posting something online or something that is disturbing, that they know they can go seek help from an individual and that that student won't be punished, um, that they will be able to kind of get the help that they receive. Um, and so couldn't agree more that we really need to be thinking strategically and thoughtfully about how we can elevate the need for emotional and mental health, how we can encourage and kind of listen to our communities about how we can best support them. And, you know, it really, it isn't a one size fit all. Um, we need to make sure that there are multiple points of entry um, and that we're talking about this and recognizing that there is a pathway forward for hope and recovery, um, because we really have a lot of work to do to make sure that we're supporting um, all families and certainly families and children of marginalized communities. It's extremely important. Absolutely. I, I, I love um, the framing around, you know, what, what you might be seeing show up is not exactly what's going on, right? It's 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 a deeper story and a bigger story and making sure um, that those resources are there to recognize that, that there is a disparity there um, for uh, justice involved youth or for young people is, you know, I think there was, you know, a, a lot of work done and research done on uh, pre-K and kindergarten and young, you know, the disparity around uh, perception of those signs and symptoms that might be mental health or pointing to mental health challenges, but really um, are dealt with in a disciplinary way or a behavioral, uh, looked at as a behavioral challenge. And so definitely um, uh, appreciate that attention to that focus. And um, it made me think of the data that I had mentioned around the finding for young women, young girls specifically, and that greater sense of hopelessness. Can you each talk about that? Um, is that something that's showing up in your practice and your area? And you know, why might those feelings be more severe around young women specifically? And either of you, uh, Dr. Coffee, if you want to kick us off, or Dr. Sure. Rob. Yeah, happy to. And um, and goodness, as you're saying, my practice, I'm seeing it in my community. Um, so I think even my um, my family friends, um, you know, coming to me with questions and concerns about their own daughters, it seems that it's so ubiquitous um, in the culture with um, young women are really struggling um, with mental health disorders. Uh, and I know in preparation for this talk, we were talking a lot too about um, the role that social media plays um, in this as well. And I don't want to uh, really... Um, 
I want to recognize that social media can have a role and people being able to connect and other things too. But goodness, um, whenever our young women um, that developmentally are at the stage of understanding who they are, right? Um, they're really coming to understand who I am in relation to my group, who I am in relation to my family. Um, and whenever they're kind of being fed um, a lot of information that might not be um, a total picture of another, uh, it can be um, quite dysregulating. It can be something that um, can be hard developmentally to process. Um, even as an adult, it's hard to process too. I think we're all really starting to understand and learn um, this huge social experiment that all of humanity is on. Um, and we should be mindful and thoughtful about how we're using social media um, and really certainly intentional about the potential adverse outcomes um, that we're seeing in our um, in our young ladies. Uh, and, you know, I think we talked too that um, you look at the national data. Um, I just presented to a, a group of physician associates and spoke on this too, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. Um, you know, um, young men, um, young boys are kind of... Uh, edging out a bit, um, but for young women, it's on the rise. Um, hopelessness is on the rise, suicidal ideation. Um, we really need to be paying attention um, to young girls, to school age and adolescent girls, because um, certainly it is a concern. Um, and we wanna make sure that we are, we're paying attention, that we're appropriately diagnosing and treating. Um, so we're able to do our best for them. Doing our best uh, takes so many different forms, right? And, and you all have talked about so many elements of that and just love the correlation between we struggle as adults and looking at young people as human. I think that's one of the tenets of mental health first aid that this, there's not this you know, separation from young people being autonomous, autonomously themselves as another individual, as opposed to relegated to, oh, the kids and, and we, you know, how we look at young people and how we, um, support them through these uh, transitions or the same kinds of supports we need as, as adult humans uh, for that to happen. So um, Dr. Rob, any reflections on the, the data as well? People change. And I think about the Supreme Court decision that made a lot of women feel hopeless. And I'm not going to talk about that. But I think that I come from a point and a place of empowerment. I went to a women's college. I went to Smith where everybody told me as a woman, you can do anything you want to do. And I think the more that we can re-strategize how to empower our young ladies across the country, the better it is. Because I think sometimes they see things or they hear hype speech or they think you're only as good as you look in your outfit on TikTok and YouTube and that's all anybody cares about. They get a very solid cultural message. You're just the surface and not what's on the inside. Mm -hmm. And I think helping them find their 10 strengths. What am I good at? What do I want to do? I can do anything as a young lady. That's what they need to see. They need to see more female teachers and politicians like our vice president and doctors and nurses and lawyers and judges. And the more we see women achieving and moving forward, and it doesn't matter that you have two X chromosomes or that you've decided that you're female, you can do what you want to do across this country. And we can't we can't go backwards. We have to go forwards and we have to support the young ladies. So things like Girls on the Run, which is a great organization that helps young ladies learn about exercise and appreciating the body that they have and taking care of them, being physically active. I think sports for young men is a very protective and wonderful bonding experience. And a lot of girls get to high school and, and college and they don't want to do sports anymore. They don't care about it. And when you think about our female athletes, they're some of the most successful people, even after their sports career ends. I think about the Williams sisters and all the amazing things they've done for youth of color and in their sport and beyond that. And I think that finding role models and people to encourage our young women is, is so important and to never give up if they don't have a great mother figure in their life, making sure that somewhere else, big sisters, any kind of activity, giving them that positive mentorship and leadership is so important. And yeah. I think I think that the internet, especially during the pandemic, the worst thing was the rise in eating disorders. And it wasn't just our young ladies, it was also young boys were also 
all hooked up in clean eating and calories and steps and all the rest of it. But that was still primarily hitting the young ladies. And younger and younger, we were seeing 10-year-olds who had to go on a diet because the internet told them so. Or mm -hmm. they measured their waist and it was too much. And it was just very tough for families yeah. and for them. Yeah. Are you seeing a shift away from that as we get further from the, the start of the global pandemic? I would say yes. We used to have 18 people a day on our consult service with eating disorders, and now we're down to mm, six. Mm -hmm. So we're back to our pre-pandemic level of people sick enough that they're in the hospital from not eating. It's gotten better. Always striving for that zero number, right? Um, and definitely uh, such a such a a way to frame, you know, how young people and young women specifically look at themselves overall as a part of their overall well-being. It's not just the mental health challenges they might experience, not just the physical health, but it's definitely um, how they view themselves and what, what are those inputs to that. And it, it made me think about what are those barriers that might exist to someone seeing themselves, a young person seeing themselves in, in the right, um, in, an, in an authentic way. I'll put it that way, and in, in, in the real, realistic way, as opposed to what, you know, those influences might be communicating. And it made me also think about the barriers just generally um, that you all as a workforce are dealing with. Uh, you mentioned earlier, Dr. Coffee. you know, there's just a lot of um, challenge that exists right now as it relates to the workforce. And you think of burnout, you think of some of the challenges that um, the, the individuals that are coming for care might be experiencing in terms of this demand, right? Um, so what's the answer? Because of course you all have all the answers. I'm confident that you have all the answers. Um, so what is the answer when it comes to, you know, this increased access challenge that we're seeing, this increased demand, and then, you know, the challenge of not having enough providers and not being able to produce new providers um, quickly enough. Um, there's so many things that you all are both are doing um, to address some of that. So can you just speak to what you see as some of those opportunities to address these? Yeah, happy to. And, and again, I think um, there's no silver bullet, right? Like there's a lot of work that needs to be done um, across multiple sectors. Um, you know, one thing I think about uh, again is really helping to develop programs in the school system. Um, we have wonderful school psychologists that work as part of our department um, and in their bridge center, they're helping to train and to educate school psychologists, help to support counselors, help to support connections between the school and how they can work with our community mental health centers um, to really make sure that we're meeting the need. It's not uncommon that children are coming in to our offices um, because of referral from the school. Um, things might've been going okay in the home and they're really struggling in the school. Um, so making sure that we can support children in the school setting to be able to work with the families. Um, I would just offer that, you know, here in Oklahoma and I think nationwide, and um, we're really struggling to have enough counselors to meet the need in the school setting. Um, and so we really need to make sure that we have adequate workforce to be able to do that. Um, we really need to make sure that we are helping to support not only that kind of direct care, um, because we have a, a billing system that allows us to kind of bill for the direct care um, with the patient, um, but, but quite often we don't have the ability to kind of um, support consultation and to support coordination in a way that can be very helpful um, for um, treatment teams and certainly working together. The other thing that comes to mind too, as you mentioned, um, you know, just the the amount of need that is out there um, as healthcare providers, mental health care providers, and others, and um, we certainly need to make sure that we are taking care of ourselves first. Um, we had the lovely opportunity here at OSU with a um, in partnership with our Department of Mental Health um, to get a Helping Connection grant from SAMHSA um, during COVID, and we started our Help for the Healer Echo. Um, so again, utilized um, technology uh, to provide healing spaces for healthcare providers, mental health care providers, and others. And um, we just got additional funding to do our fourth round of Help for the Healer, um, and certainly think that's been something that's been very helpful for our community to come together and to share. Um, I say this all the time, um, you know, I'll, I'll say it till 
till the end of times, just the importance of making sure we're taking care of ourselves. Um, it is um, really not possible to give from an empty cup. Um, and I too sometimes need that reminder. And um, we get into the work of, of doing um, as, um, as therapists, as physicians, we identify as such, I'm a doctor, I'm a therapist, I'm a psychologist, this is what I do, this is who I am. Uh, but we too have to remember that we are human um, and the work is hard. Uh, we know that vicarious traumatization is a, is a part of the work that we do. And we need to make sure that we're able to recognize that within ourselves uh, make sure that we're able to seek help when needed. Um, and then the other plug I might say too, is I think recognize the role of peer supervision and supports. Um, quite often that might be the first thing to go. Um, you know, whenever we're busy, kind of attending to our patients' needs, to our agency needs. Um, but I, I can't stress enough the importance of making sure that we are talking with others that know the work that we do. Um, I certainly value my peer supervision. Um, I, I joke with my residents that I teach and, and others that I'm, I'm still asking other child psychiatrists, is this the right way to do it? I'm kind of feeling bad about this. Um, and I am so appreciative of that. I think we need to normalize the importance of us asking help. Um, for our patients and for our practice and for ourselves, because um, it really, it's a lot of hard work. And I think there's a lot we can do um, to make sure that we're meeting the need of our patients um, and certainly our own needs as well. Good nuggets and reminders. I think sometimes we get into the thick of going and doing that we forget we're not human doings, right? Um, and so definitely an opportunity there, Dr. Rob. The American Academy of Pediatrics has realized that, that pediatric residents need to learn about mental health care. And now as part of their training, instead of just time in the NICU, they're supposed to get several hundred hours over three years of child mental health education and training. Of course, that means somebody has to provide that and it, it will in large part fall upon us and how we do that so they are empowered and so they walk away feeling like they can do the work because before 1994 when the black box warning came out pediatricians especially seasoned ones were fairly comfortable handing out ssris when they thought somebody in their office was depressed or anxious they they knew how to titrate it. They knew it was safe and overdose, and they felt comfortable. They understood kids. The black box warning came out, and the level of fear around providing mental health care to primary, out of primary care pediatricians' offices, rose dramatically. At internists, they weren't scared. They hand out chemotherapy. They were fine, but pediatricians are risk adverse providers, and and that level of risk became too much, and educating them from the beginning so they can ask the questions, so they can start medication, so they can titrate meds, will help, again, go back to the medical home, provide care where they're comfortable, and leave us to do the really hard stuff like that suicidal child with autism or the person with bipolar or the first break psychosis. I think the other thing is being flexible in work. So I've had a couple people who worked for me over the pandemic, one got very ill and and then couldn't come back to work right away. And so how do you function as a physician? And because we had the Virginia Mental Health Access Line, I had that person man the calls in the morning. The salary was covered. They were providing mental health care, but they weren't taxing their endurance and their pulmonary capacity, seeing half a day of patients, which is much more taxing than talking to another provider or i had somebody else with who had a baby right at the start of the pandemic and was on our consult service and was scared and overwhelmed and just wanted to quit i said go on our prn staff and when somebody else is on maternity leave we'll call you back to staff clinic and she's like i can do that i said yeah i can do anything i want to do i'm the boss and and that helped me save a wonderful psychiatrist a wonderful teacher and a great clinician who loves being busy, but right now is really there to take care of her kids and is is invested in them, but is great when she comes back. And so I, I kept someone by being flexible. I think sometimes, especially for, for both men and women with young families, we're sort of like, we have a 1.0 FTE. If you can't do that, we can't hire you. Have two people share a job. You'll get more than 20 hours out of each of them but they can titrate that to their family's needs or 
somebody wants to be there during the week, but they have a partner home on the weekend, they'll do weekend call on your inpatient unit, but they can't do weekday stuff because they're busy. Mm -hmm. Everybody would be happy to have someone do weekend call. I had somebody do that for a year and a half, and then I convinced her to join the rest of the faculty. <laughs> so I got her full time. But great for for a long time, we we reduced our call burden by fifty percent by having someone like that. I think you have to think outside the box, and I think you need to meet people where they are, or you lose amazing people and that talent. It takes so long to get through all the school and residency and medical school and fellowship and mm -hmm. and you have this amazing resource and to lose that i i think the last thing is in this in this region over the last year we lost one medical student and and two residents to suicide mm -hmm. and i think sometimes we miss the signs mm -hmm. and i think the most important thing you can say is if you think something isn't right, see if you can help, ask if you can do anything. I think sometimes people, especially women, put on this brave face of I must do everything and I cannot ask for help. I can't be one of those weak women and I have to sort of march on through. And and it it doesn't have to be that way. Depression is a treatable illness. We shouldn't be losing people to suicide. And mm -hmm. right after all of that happened, our, our child psychiatry and child neurology divisions had a, had a joint brunch for all our trainees just to let them know, with no other faculty members, just to let them know that, that we appreciated them and we wanted to do something nice for them and their families. Because we, we spend so much time working, 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 and the thank yous aren't always a lot in the land of psychiatry. Everybody thanks the heart surgeon, not everybody thanks the mental health care practitioner. And we yeah. do hard work. We do sure. really hard work. And if we as the, the the people in charge and leadership can say thank you, it, it means so much. You all hit on some amazing, amazing points. I could talk to you for another two hours, but we don't have that kind of time today. I'm sure we all uh, have things we need to get to. But if there was... Um, one thing I will say is that you have hit on um, so many opportunities for all of us to take away things like um, being flexible and thinking through ways in which we might be able to engage differently, whether that be on the provider side or the direct care that we're providing. You talked about the need to have culturally relevant care um, and make sure that how we're training people is for what they actually deal with day to day. So I think that's Im imperative. Talk about the role of caregivers and schools and individuals, uh, how we can support um, even in non-traditional traditional spaces um, and so appreciate your willingness to kind of share with our community um, this, this opportunity for us to do more. Um, but is there anything that you want to address that wasn't covered uh, in a 30 second spot uh, before we wrap up today? I, th I think substance use is something we didn't talk on. And, and one of the most amazing things that happened for us is we, we have a child psychiatrist who joined our faculty with a substance use training. And because he was in such demand, we're splitting him with Howard University. So at Howard, he sees the adults. And on our site, he sees the teens and the younger children with, with substance use. But I think, especially in, in pediatric mental health care, it's always in, lurking in the background. We don't always ask about it. But if it goes untreated, the other mental health care disorder doesn't necessarily get better. So I think that's been a big issue, at least in DC. Yeah, such an opportunity for a future Wellbeing Wednesday episode for sure. Uh, Dr. Coffey. Um, yeah, I guess I'm just kind of resonating too on the, we touched a little bit on kind of barriers and stigma, but just recognizing that as well, that I think the more that we can talk about this within our communities, normalizing that going to see a therapist is like going to check in with your pediatrician. Um, I really do think that youth are doing this quite a bit. They're talking about it more, which is really great uh, because we shouldn't be ashamed if we're struggling with anxiety or depression, if we're needing coping skills and other things as well. And so really kind of normalizing um, what it means to seek treatment, I think is really important um, for all of us and certainly for our youth. Such a wonderful place to wrap up. I couldn't have said it better. 
Um, and I just want to thank you both for everything uh, that you shared with uh, our community today and so appreciate each of you and your leadership and the work that you are um, continuing in your communities to make sure that we eradicate the stigma around mental health and substance use challenges across the country. So uh, thank you. I mean, it was fascinating conversation and it, it concludes this episode of Wellbeing Wednesdays, which is brought to you uh, by the National Council for Mental Wellbeing. Thank you all and be well.